the panel tonight is Jack Manning Bancroft from the Australian Indigenous Mentoring Experience, or better known as AIM. Good to see you, Jack. Thanks, AIM. Uh, also here is founder of Professional Mums, Kate Mills. Nice to see you. Pleasure. Uh, and in Melbourne tonight, David Hetherington from Think Tank Per Capita. Hello, Hamish. And you can join us on Twitter, as always, using the hashtag The Drum and on Facebook as well. Well, first tonight, can our leaders finally find a fix for a problem that has eluded every generation of political leaders in Australia? Today, federal, state and territory Indigenous Affairs ministers met to discuss how to refresh the Closing the Gap strategy, which will shape where $300 billion is invested. The Closing the Gap strategy was set up 10 years ago, aiming to reduce disadvantage for Indigenous Australians. Since the targets were set, every one of them, bar one, has failed. There's been no significant improvement to Indigenous life experience expectancy or child mortality rates. It's expected a final strategy, which could include home ownership or community safety objectives, won't actually be finalised until mid next year. Well, Rod Little is the co-chair of the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples. He's met with state and territory ministers in Canberra today. He joins us now. Uh, Rod Little, is this a moment for optimism? And there, there's so much to be ashamed of in terms of the lack of progress. Is there something about this moment that makes you think there is reason for, for hope? Yeah, absolutely. Hope comes around every election. <laughs> and and, and for not only for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, but for broader, broader Australians as well. Um, every election, those are the kinds of things that we're confronted with in this term. I think we've had about seven ministers and, and uh, just about equally amount of number of prime ministers. 10 years in that 10 years. So this is a very difficult time. Uh, but the Ministerial Council, as I understand it, only met about eight years ago. So um, this is an opportune time for us and we were really appreciated the opportunity to sit down and have a conversation with uh, key ministers, including the Federal Minister, about I think it's probably more we are optimistic about smashing the disadvantage We've got to aim that eye. And I think that the willingness today in the room that we had was about building relationships, about having respect and trusting one another, but directing where the investment should be made, where it will make a difference to people's lives. But given the failure of this whole approach so far, isn't it clear that a lot more than willingness, relationship building, goodwill is required? Well, absolutely. But like I said, you know, there's the, uh, the optimism and the hope that comes around every cycle. So you're dealing with different people all the time. Today we want to do this, uh, you know, with, with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, in particular the National Congress, right at the table from the beginning. Uh, there wasn't that, that presence in the past. Um, and I think that this is now an opportunity to progress. The other thing to, to remember is that our vision is for it to be a generational change. So it, it must be thought about, this approach must be thought about long term investment beyond any term of government. So uh, we, we're talking about parliaments uh, 15 to 20 years on and the investment has to be long term. Uh, I'm interested to hear what you think about that, Jack, this idea of sort of long-term outcomes. Do you share that sense of optimism without having been at the meeting today? More broadly, do you share that kind of optimism? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, Rod's been around the game for a lot longer than I have and to, that narrative is important. I think, you know, it's a message to every Aboriginal kid out there that there's reason to be hopeful and if we, if we consistently put that forward, it starts becoming a self-fulfilling reality and so that with clever design and and strong initiatives into the education units into early health prevention and building those capacities up mean you, you do it within a generation do you have faith in in clever design actually being implemented i mean as we just heard there you know plenty of goodwill obviously an opportunity given that people are all in the one room uh, but mightn't some australians particularly indigenous australians see it as just more talk the one, the one piece which has been met is Year 12 attainment. So what we're doing is we're educating more Indigenous people than ever before to reach levels where they can 
proudly played ball in both worlds and, and hopefully I think what we're, we're seeing a lot of is, is pride within the kids' identity as well. I know so you're not going to claim responsibility for the whole thing, but in large part what you do has helped that one thing be met. Yeah, but it's got nothing It's got nothing if the ecosystem of what people like Rod has done before and what they're still doing paves a way for us to then be able to come through as the next generation. So when, when he's talking about the generational cycle, this is a prime example of it on television. You know, you've got someone who's going and leading the advocacy, then we're going in and working with kids on the ground and if these kids then pick up that mantelpiece you can you can realistically see that Indigenous Australia is going to be only stronger moving forward and if we continue to invest in education that's going to change so I, I echo the hope and I also think it's you've got to have ministers leading with positivity with hope in, in light of the, the danger of negativity and hopelessness if we don't have a positive narrative it never lifts people up and I think that consistent <coughs> narrative is important. No, I, I agree and I was wondering if I can ask Rod this so I agree and it's great to hear from you Rod that you felt so positive but can I ask do we know 10 years on what actually works and what <coughs> hasn't? Like I think that's part of some of the and I hate to be the cynical one some of the cynicism that sits around it we hear this story come out every year you know eight years in nine years in ten years in broadly the same story do we know 10 years on what actually works and where we should focus our attention? Well, I think one of the key things that the focus is on that one, uh, I guess, assumed success where there isn't an unpacking of what has failed and to, to understand why that failing has happened, how do we do things, how did, how did government or whoever was involved, what went wrong at a particular time. I understand that generally when there are, and I've been government myself, is that when, when targets and these things, frameworks are set up, there, there isn't a check-in points along the way to see whether we're on track. You might have an annual report, but that's an annual report at the end of the year. Um, you know, to affirm the effects of the efforts is, has to be done with the beneficiaries, and that is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. You know, if a child was born 10 years ago, we know what the failings have done to that person now. We don't want that to happen for the next 10 or 20 years. So, Rod, just on that point, what's, what's the opportunity for more Indigenous involvement in the local design and management of these programs? I think it's terrific, as you say, that this time round, the National Congress is represented at the table from the beginning. But I guess there's a fear out there that a lot of this money is controlled by bureaucracies in Canberra and, and the state capitals. What opportunity is there for, for local Indigenous communities to be involved in the design and management of the programs? Yeah, look, I think this, this is a very important point that you've made, David, is that we, we strongly urge governments to have a look at where the investments go. And we, we've seen uh, with the IAS, there's a, is a, I guess, attempt to, to gain some efficiencies but at the end of the day that small group or that family or that small community haven't have a, had a say in the, the design and development of that policy shift and, and I think that is so important. And you know, let's not forget, we, we've got very experienced people in our communities. We've got some very intelligent, very uh, experienced, qualified people in our communities to contribute to the design and development of meaningful uh, and, and culturally and also socially and economically uh, pursuing kinds of programs that is going to elevate us and give us some equality to participate in society. But we just need to invest in people's uh, capacity to develop and grow. I wonder though, Rod, if I can just pin you a little bit on the question that Kate put to you about whether we know what works. Uh, one of the areas in which there has been success is in education, getting Indigenous kids through to the end of high school, uh, getting Indigenous people with ter tertiary educations and then into jobs. Can you unpack why there has been some improvement there? Well, I, I certainly still question that claim, you see, because, uh, you know, we, we can put three people through a, a system and, and we can mark people and we can, we can say, yes, they've done all right. But how, we've, how have we checked that with those students? And how, how have we tested their skills acquisition and, and their learnings along the way to ensure that, yes, they're going to transition onto uh, employment and or further education? 
I mean, I, I, I think, I'm not saying that it hasn't been effective or successful, but you want to be able to measure that success and repeat that success, not be just saying, oh, look, those have failed. We need to understand why things have failed, but also why things, are, why things have been successful. If that is not um, embedded in the framework to begin with, like we're saying with this opportunity, we want to be able to say, we need some milestone checks along the way, check in to see how we're going, um, and, and to affirm with the beneficiaries of those programs and services whether they're, that is helping them get a better understanding of the whole picture and, and a better understanding of where their goals and aspirations might lead them and whether they have the capabilities of, of getting through to those to their goals. So those, those are the kinds of things that I think that have been missing from uh, any kind of uh, program or policy shift. And, and there are many that are uh, around that are good examples. Um, I mean, AIM's one of those good examples, but let me, let me just talk about, just quickly... Okay, okay, uh, but while you're on AIM then, I want to bring Jack in on this, because mm. uh, although you're expressing some scepticism of, of <laughs> those outcomes, I mean, you are dealing with young people that are success stories every day. Do you have some insight into why there has been improvement, particularly in that area of education? Yeah, global-backed research that the one of the most controllable risk factors we can actually change in a kid's outcomes is mindset. And if we can shift yeah. mindset, it can actually change. It can beat housing, it can beat parental outcomes, it can beat teacher quality. If you can build the mindset and the resilience of that student, they can, they can navigate their way so through difficult scenarios. So how do you do scenarios. that? Well, it starts with what Rod's doing right now, which is saying we're not just going to close the gap, we're going to smash the gap. So earlier to your question about, oh, Jack, you know, we hear the, the, the expressions of this is all good and warm and fuzzy. It's actually a significant statement to Indigenous people watching this show and to people who are surrounded with Indigenous people to go, you know what, we have the highest possible expectations in you guys to perform, to, to perform at a level which everybody assumes you're going to be successful. And it's worked mm -hmm. with... You know, but, but, in the, but if that's true, isn't basing our whole strategy around the notion of closing the, ba the gap almost uh, the opposite of what we should be doing? Well, I th you know, again, when you, when you hear Rod saying we're going to try and smash the gra gap, I think that idea that we move beyond a narrative, you know, equality's great, but I'd yeah. love to see Aboriginal people... It's a people... pretty negative framing for the whole thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a base to start from a significant disadvantage to try and get equality. If you, if you look at what the intent is, it's to try and bring about an equal and fair society for our first Australians who have been left behind. Now that's... that's... And, and can I say to that, to me, the whole issue around mindset to me seems like a much better policy than some of the policies you see coming up, like yeah. home ownership, for example, and what home ownership is going to do, how you're going to, yeah, how you're going to institutionalise it, how you're going to make it happen. I think working at those much more sort of um, base uh, subjects, if you like, around mindset, you, we'll, we'll have a lot more well, success. Home ownership is going to be really critical as well because a lot of, you know, my, my mum's one of seven children and, you know, one or two of them own a home and my grandfather wasn't able to own, you know, his own property and so you start to actually get to a position where you can't pass on wealth and so when you're starting from a position where you're, you're not inheriting wealth or assets, then you st you're starting from well behind the eight ball as well. So it, it does take a multi-tiered approach. And I think the mindset is one thing that every single principal in the country, every single Australian citizen can actually buy into and it's free. And that's, that's something simple. If we have the highest possible expectations for our Indigenous people to perform at the highest possible levels, and from Indigenous people as well, that's a big step. Uh, the rest is the policy stuff that, that Rod and the gang are working on and, and we fit into that picture with school kids in a, in a small section trying to raise them up because we know that when education achieves parity and when it's done not at a cost to cultural confidence and identity, that you can actually have both of them together, then you're off in a, in a pretty strong foundation to have a successful and happy life. All right, I reckon that's a good point to end the conversation on that topic today. Rod Little, uh, thanks for joining us from Canberra. I know you've had a big and very busy day, so thanks for coming in to talk to us tonight. Thanks very much, Hamish. Rod Little.